Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Live Trading of the Final Fed Decision of 2015. Today's presenters are John Nettle and Neil Azus. Welcome, John and Neil. How are you doing? Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here. Thanks. My name is Tom Hartle. I am CQG's Director of Product Training. I will be your host and moderator today. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter them into the Q&A section window at any time. We'll have John and Neil answer the questions either during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. If you're viewing the presentation in full screen mode, you can find Q&A in the WebEx toolbar at the top of your screen in the drop-down menu on the far right. If you're having any sound issues, please contact the host via WebEx chat. We'll be recording today's webinar, and it will be posted within 48 hours to the events section on news.cqg.com. All registered attendees will receive an email with a link to the recording. As always, there is the important risk disclosure. The forthcoming presentation is for informational purposes only. The data shared by the presenters is believed to be accurate. By continuing to view this presentation, you are consenting to hold the presenters, CQG Incorporated, John Nettle, Neil Azus, and their affiliates harmless for the outcome of any trades you put on as a result of viewing this webinar. Now I'd like to have John and Neil tell us a little bit about themselves. Hello, everyone. This is uh, once again an honor. This is John Netto here um, with my close friend, Neil Azus, and it's an honor to be here today. We have the opportunity to, again, show a process that, that, that I've used and that Neil has used um, in the markets. And, it, and what's going to happen today is Neil's going to go ahead and give the, the primer over the next 25 minutes. He's going to walk through the process that I'm going to then piggyback on and trade the markets with. So Neil will take it from me here, and he'll have it for the next 25 minutes and about a quarter to the hour. I'll take over and go over some specifics, and then we'll get to trading. Great. Thanks very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you also to CQG. Uh, we'll leave it to you guys to go through our bios because there's no time for vanity today, and the Fed meets in a short period of time. And besides, we're going to over the next 30 minutes, you're going to get kind of our true resume anyway. So let's just get started. Uh, we have three simple rules when we do webinars. Number one, let's learn something. Number two, we're here to either make money or save money. And number three, let's have some fun. Okay, there's a slide here called Trading Macro Events, four bullet points. Uh, number one, we're going to show you through a set of our proprietary tools how we filter through the FOMC statement and the set projections coming out to determine what the relevant information. We're going to share with those results with you shortly after the FOMC release. Number two, we're going to tell you what parts of the release actually matter the economic projections, whether each meeting is live, and number three, defining the gradual pace of rate hikes. Number three, I'm going to share with you uh, each asset class and the key proxy in each asset class and how they're going to be impacted by the FOMC release. And then finally, I'm going to share with you how fixed income is pricing in four different scenarios right now and what moves will likely follow as a result of the different outcomes. Okay, we have a slide here called Four Quadrants. Take a look at this simple grouping, all right? The interest rate hike story can be put into four quadrants, and here's how we think about each one. So number one, right, with both negative interest rates and additional asset purchases, as you know, QE. Number two, an extended delay in raising interest rates, or one and done. Number three, a more gradual pace of interest hikes, or about two per year, which equates to the market pricing the equal probability of an interest rate increase, decrease, or no move at each meeting over the next 18 months. Number four, a measured pace of interest rate increases, or about three or more interest rate increases over a 12-month period. Just as a reference point, a dovish hike, quote unquote, is between quadrant two and quadrant three, right, with a stronger skew towards quadrant two, right? And then up until late last week when we had this risk asset correction, uh, the market was priced actually between quadrant three and quadrant four with a much stronger skew towards four, right, which has literally been walked back a fair amount over the last few days. And just as a quick frame of reference, during the last rate hiking, rate hiking cycle back in 04 to 06, 
Chairman Greenspan raised rates 17 consecutive meetings in a row at 25 basis points each. That's the very definition of a measured pace in case you're looking for a reference point. Okay, moving forward. So now that we have an understanding of how we think about each type of Federal Reserve narrative, we need a toolkit to build a trading plan. In our toolkit, we have six tools. One, a model. Two, a probability framework. Three, a decision tree. A dot plot, a rainbow, and finally a game plan. Okay, and we're gonna walk through briefly each of those before we get into the nuts and bolts of this. All right, so this is our most important part. This is our FOMC model. So sort of to just set the stage of this model and really set the stage for the next few tools in our toolkit, we want to walk you through how we think about things. And we want you to think about things purely through the prism of probabilities, nothing more, trading probabilities. And here's what we mean by that. When you make a bet on something happening in the future, we don't really care whether it happens or not. We only care whether somebody else actually thinks it's going to happen. And if they're certain something is going to happen, then there's just no upside if it actually does happen. So, for example, from a market perspective, if the S&P 500 had fallen 10% in today's meeting, then you would probably believe that the market was already discounting a hawkish outcome and vice versa. So on our FOMC model, these two representations, right, capture this thought process. So let's take a look at the first bar chart. The first bar chart looks at the implied probability of a hike, quote unquote, by a certain meeting, which is the cumulative, that's the key word, cumulative probability of every meeting before that point. So in layman's terms, we want to know what the probability of a move between December and June is, which stands at about 100% right now. Okay, I've just put my cursor over that. It's around 99%, so 199, okay? So meaning that it's a 50-50 shot of them hiking in March and or June unless something changes, okay? The bottom probability chart is slightly different. This chart extrapolates the specific probability of a hike at a certain meeting, okay? Meaning that once the outcome of today's meeting is known, what is the probability of a hike in March or June as well, okay? So what's the model telling us right now? In the market's mind, the outcome in today's meeting is already priced. It's already been decided. It's 100% chance, roughly, that we are going to raise interest rates today. After today, all eight meetings next year, okay, starting here, all right, where I put my cursor, is pretty much a coin flip or a 50-50 shot of a hike occurring, okay? All right, moving on to our uh, probability framework, okay? Take a look at this uh, matrix below. I'm going to just use a quote from a wise trader that taught us a bunch of things a long time ago. Life is just a range between probably and probably not. Okay, so if you look at our matrix, this is 20 to 30 percent downside in red, which is probable. I'm sorry, is uh, is uh, probably not, and 75 to 87 percent. Okay, uh, is is uh, probable. Okay, <clears throat> in our experience, pretty much all outcomes fall into that range. So let's apply these ranges to the fixed income market and the future path of FOMC policy here, okay? The major question being asked today, right, for U.S. interest rates, if we get liftoff, what would you expect the probability of March to move to, okay? Converting this question to the language from our table is, right, the Fed, quote, unquote, probably moves again in March, right, or the Fed, quote, unquote, probably does not move again, okay? And now to put that in pricing terms real quick, using the March 2016 euro dollar future. Uh, if you guys are all up on your CQG machine, uh, the symbol for uh, the March euro dollar future is Echo Delta Alpha Hotel 6, okay? So based on where it's trading right now at 99.34, okay, the probable means that they trade to a price of 99.30, down four ticks, okay? which is this one up here where I put my cursor. Quote, unquote, probably not, means that they're gonna trade up eight ticks to 99.42. That's how we apply it, okay? So you can see very quickly which side of the market the asymmetry lies on at the moment. It's clearly to the upside if March becomes off the table after we get the communication today, okay? So let me just emphasize one last line of thinking here, right? As we approach settlement, in the next 35 minutes and get the statement and the dots, right? 
and because we live in a digital world, there's only two outcomes, and those outcomes are the same, meaning the probability of a Fed outcome one way or the other is either going to zero or, by, or one by definition. It's either going to happen or it doesn't. For us, we just want to stay in the trading game as long as possible. So we don't really care if a probability ultimately goes to 100. We're just interested in catching a move from 50% probability where March is priced right now up to or down to one of our ranges, either 75 or 85% or down to 30%, right? Everybody else can have the last 20% uh, and get the confirmation of their ego that they got something right. We just want to trade the probabilities back and forth within the guts of our range, okay? Okay, so this is our decision tree. Now that we've analyzed our FOMC model and the probability framework from the slide before, we need to actually transfer that output to a decision tree, all right? It just allows us to put everything that's in our head now in proper context. And real quickly, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but I just want to point out what each field means in our decision tree. So go at least once. Right now, it's the same as the probability for the outcome of today's meeting since this year is almost over, but it becomes a much more important variable for the March and June meetings if we're trying to determine how many times the Fed is actually going to hike rates in the first half of next year. So, for example, moving to go twice, right? The probability of the Fed hiking twice by March of next year, which is the top, uh, the top square in our tree highlighted here in yellow, right, is at 58%, okay? Our third part of our decision tree is no go at all. This is the very bottom box on the right side, right, uh, uh, of the tree, and the odds of the Fed not hiking at all by March. And then finally, uh, go December, which is today, the probability that the Fed hikes, quote, unquote, at the December meeting per our probability slide, um, or sorry, per our FOMC model a couple of slides ago. Uh, these blue boxes here on the right are just um, a way for us to actually export that information to our, from our decision tree into actually euro dollar prices so we can quickly decide if something is actually trading rich or cheap based on our view. All right, the infamous dot plot, okay? When it comes to a tool here, we create our own proprietary dot plot. You can see in the top left here uh, our dot plot. Let me just uh, move that closer here. Right, um, and we, we transfer the traditional dot plot that you all see into a table, okay? We've also included behind that and mapped out a dot plot um, that comes from PIMCO. Now, just as a way of background real quick, uh, the Fed, when they release their dot plot, it doesn't have a name for them uh, next to each dot. PIMCO's done an eloquent job of trying to recreate it, you know, based on their assumptions. Um, in our case, we just look at something different, which we'll explain in one quick second, but we wanted to show you two different representations, okay? So just as way of background, um, every quarter the Fed has to compile their own economic forecast for three variables, GDP, inflation, and unemployment, and then they use some mousetrap like the Taylor Rule, et cetera, to determine uh, where they think interest rates need to be somewhere in the future based on those forecasts, okay? Now, we all know these forecasts are very optimistic. They have been optimistic for the last five years, which is the reason they've largely waited until today to actually raise interest rates, okay? But the fact is, is over the last two months, a number of people have highlighted that the dot plot is going to be a major signaling tool going forward. So unfortunately, we have no choice but to pay attention to it. So the way we sort of decipher through all of this is by creating our own dot plot or our own table, okay? So in this case, we're actually only going to focus on four of the dots instead of all 17 of the FOMC members, and we're going to focus on the four that we think are the most, four, uh, most important. Real quick, why do we discount the other 13 voters? This is pretty basic. The, the, the first answer is, is that if you've ever heard the quote, economists predict not because they know but because they're asked to, the answer is, is that they just don't predict very well. So listening to them is actually hazardous to your P&L. Okay. And then the second thing is we want to remove any outliers or the people we believe who are actually living in fantasy land. So, for example, uh, Bullard is up at 3.5% right at the top. That's an outlier. And then down at the bottom, uh, Coach Lakota is uh, actually in negative rates. So he's joining uh, Bullard in fantasy land and never, never land. So we just want to remove those people from our thought process. And then ultimately, we just want to focus on the two economists that actually have the hot hand, which is Evans 
right here, and uh, Lael Brainerd, right, who've been forecasting pretty good right now. And then, of course, we want to focus on Chair Janet Yellen and uh, New York Fed Bill Dudley because they're uh, two very important mouthpieces for um, the actual influencing the committee members, and, and that's it. So collectively, we think these four dots have the most sway over deciding Fed policy. And, and to, uh, to sort of crystallize that thought process, the euro dollar curve heading into today's meeting has largely been priced literally off the average of only these four dots. So that's kind of our starting point. Okay, moving on to this slide called a rainbow or euro dollar futures, okay? We've now showed you our model, we've showed you a probability framework, we've shown you a decision tree, we've shown you a dot plot. It's time for the fifth tool, okay? We refer to the euro dollar future market as the rainbow, okay? These futures and options markets, if you're not familiar with them, are the deepest, most liquid, and most flexible instruments in the world. And because there's such a wide variety of instruments available to you right now, almost literally like in a digital manner, you can actually recreate all the probabilities or any scenario analysis that you've generated, all right? So you can read this another time or bring this up on your CQG screen, but these are the packs of the euro dollars, uh, and we are looking uh, uh, mainly at the next, uh, you know, the, the reds, the, the reds, the greens, and the blues, uh, you know, to provide guidance here in the short term. Okay, so we've got four scenarios in fixed income, okay, and we need to recreate these probabilities using these euro dollars or the rainbow. And we've effectively created four strategies here for you. One's called the no rate hike, okay, a second one is a one and done trade, the third one is the pace of trades, and then the fourth one is the next meeting trade. For the purposes of saving time here, we're not actually going to go through every one of these scenarios. We're just going to take you through one of them, but then you can refer to this uh, in between to look at the others. So, for example, on strategy one, what we call the no, no hike trade, the Fed's not going to hike interest rates today, okay? If you were to buy the January 15th, March euro dollars, the 99 and a half call strike, right? Uh, again, it's uh, Echo David Alpha Hotel 6 in your screens, right? for 75 ticks, all right, or 0.75 ticks, and they don't hike rates today, right? Our view is the payout's gonna be 12 to one on that option. So you have a direct or a defined risk profile where you know exactly how much you can lose, and you have largely one of the most asymmetric setups in the marketplace in a highly liquid place using this Euro dollar option contract, okay? And the rationale going back to our uh, probability matrix of the world that we live in of probably and probably not, it seems quote unquote impossible that the Fed would not hike given that the market's pricing in quote unquote a certainty as per our rate model, right, of a move at the moment. It may not be the right one at this point because if the Fed didn't hike, it would be even more extreme than what we learned about earlier in the month with the European Central Bank um, in terms of P&L destruction but it highlights exactly how asymmetric the setup is if they don't do that, right? So again, we have a, a, a second strategy here down below if you're interested in doing that on a one and done trade. Uh, very briefly beforehand, uh, the market should be able to facilitate these give or take your size uh, in the next 30 minutes. Um, and then on the next slide, we have a, a strategy uh, for a, uh, the pace of rate trades and also what would happen if they're going to hike at the next meeting in, in uh, March. Okay, the next quarterly meeting in March. Okay, and finally, our last tool. So you're armed with all this output from the previous five tools. What we do every time we think about a trade is create a trade matrix that includes a predefined game plan for both gains and losses. And we obviously strongly recommend you do something very similar for every trade. But what we try to do intellectually is write down everything on the left side, understand our risk rewards, our stops, how much we're risking relative to our NAV or our actual P&L in our account, right, et cetera. We write down the thesis one more time. We write down a predefined game plan for the gains here, the losses here, right, and we make sure we stick to that. And this is the final tool. We find this very valuable in just sort of crystallizing everything that we talked about in the, in the other five tools um, previously. All right, um, we're going to be back uh, on this slide after the actual data comes out at 2 p.m. or the statement, because what we'll be able to do is take the original Fed model that we showed you, add a second bar to it, and show you a before and after snapshot, exactly what it looks like 
uh, based on the communication we receive and how the, the, the interest rate markets begin to reprice over the next several minutes what the next set of probabilities are, and then we can recalibrate all of our strategies going forward if we want to participate in the minutes after or the days after. So we'll be back with that in a little bit with an update. Okay. Okay. Uh, the most important part, as we said out of the gate, uh, you know, this business is about either making money or saving money. So we laid out four different scenarios for you about how Fed policy will be received. Okay. Uh, number one, a no hike, meaning zero interest rates forever. Number two, the dovish hike, one and done. Number three, a consensus hike. We're going to hike and have a gradual pace thereafter. And then number four, a hawkish hike. We're going to get a hike and a measured pace thereafterwards. Okay, so this is our scenario analysis very quickly, okay? On the left side here, we've got those four regimes we just talked about right here. And then in these colors here, we've kind of identified what instruments we think will have the most acute response to any one of these scenarios. Green means the asset's going to go up. Red obviously means the asset's going to go down. Uh, and then blue is more of a relative value strategy, which we'll, we'll explain in, in, in a minute. Uh, and then we have some notes here in, uh, in uh, black. Um, which are just more neutral. And we'll explain this bottom chart here at the end. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, real quick, just to touch again on interest rates, we're not going to rehash the four strategies that we just mentioned a, uh, a minute ago. Um, but as I've said, these have been skewed more to a neutral outcome as a result of the risk asset correction over the last few days. Um, so, uh, and, and so some of the potential hawkishness has already been priced out of the market, and implied volatility, as you all know, has been substantially bid up as a result of that. So if you're deciding to do something either way, we would make an argument that you're being generously compensated or, or paid for any risk at the moment in either direction. Um, so let's just focus on some of the other assets real quick. Uh, let's just jump right into risky assets. Uh, risky assets being defined as equities for the moment, okay? So I just want to reiterate, this is the most complicated of all the asset classes, uh, and I do not personally view this as a directional trade. This is more of a relative value trade. So let's just start with the S&P 500, which is the uh, proxy for global beta, right? So our view in general is, is that risk assets are now prepared for a, uh, an interest rate hike today. Right? The Fed has never raised interest rates with the spot VIX or volatility index over 25. On Monday of this week, it was at 25. So it's fair to make an argument that we've priced in a lot of the uncertainty around the outcome of a rate hike today, at least when it comes to the S&P 500. Directionally, though, the S&P 500 is a big wild card to us. Okay? Instead, we find it much easier to envision a relative value trade uh, um, versus U.S. small caps or European equities, for example. So on a hawkish outcome, for example, U.S. equities in general should go down, but small caps should underperform, which has been the trend recently. If you look at a chart of IWM versus SPY, you'll see that it's broken to a new cycle uh, price in this week alone, okay? At the same time, if the U.S. dollar were to strengthen and the euro was to weaken, right, that's a tailwind for European equities, which are predominantly exporters. Okay, so hence on a hawkish outcome, long SPY versus short IWM or long hedge versus short SPY makes a lot of sense and happen to fit the current narratives that are being priced into those, uh, those ratios currently. Okay, and conversely on a dovish outcome, the market obviously is going to have to unwind some of that positioning and that means small caps will outperform and European equities will underperform. Moving over to uh, commodities real quick. This is an interesting sector. Um, a hawkish outcome to me means crude oil and gold are on their way to making new lows by the end of this year, maybe even in the next few days, okay? Conversely, on a dovish outcome, there's an argument that crude oil is actually bottom for 2015. Now, now to be clear, <clears throat> that's not a call that crude oil is actually going to go up or we're going to see a big short covering event, but there's going to be a much larger case to be made without the 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 the, the, the headwind of the U.S. dollar, that a pause is now likely an outcome at a minimum, at least when it comes to the barrel, okay? In gold's case, our view is that the short base is obviously very substantial. We're all looking at the same situation as everybody else, right? But when it comes to commodities, right after a digital event like the FOMC, 
Uh, gold is where you find liquidity outside of crude oil. It's not going to be in platinum and palladium despite larger moves in those uh, assets than gold. So our view is, is that gold will be a place to go to find liquidity and cover shorts uh, on a weaker dollar, and there's probably 20 to $40 of upside in that. If they don't hike, all bets are off. There's going to be an epic short squeeze um, where all the U.S. dollar long positions that were not taken out at the ECB meeting earlier in the week, I'm sorry, earlier in the month, are going to have to be dramatically curtailed. And as a result, gross exposure in the leveraged community is going to come down in general. And that means the commodity complex is going to bounce. You can make up the narrative as to why it's going to bounce, but make no mistake, right, if that actually happens, well, some people might make money by trying to catch platinum or gold to the upside. That's outright P&L destruction because on the asset side of your T-square, you're going to be long the dollar that's going down. And on your liability side of the T-square, your shorts are going to be in your face and probably three times as much as your longs go down. Okay, so you're going to lose both ways, but more so on the short side. When it comes to currencies, okay, right, the U.S. dollar obviously is the main currency in question for today's decision. You know, from there, the question is whether or not the strategy is to trade against a developed market or an emerging market pair, right? Very recently, um, as you can see in the risk asset correction, a lot of assets tend to to, um, to perform or watch their uh, money be repatriated back to their home countries, and they've actually performed fairly poorly um, uh, against what one might actually think. So, for example, Japanese yen has had the most acute move. It's strengthened a fair amount, despite the fact that there's a Bank of, uh, Bank of Japan meeting two days from now, where some people think if the Fed hikes today, they might actually ease. So, our point is, is, is that while the developed market currencies are places to go and get liquidity, right after this event, that's not necessarily going to translate into having the greatest outperformance relative to, say, a, a emerging market currency if we actually get a hawkish scenario. So uh, how would we play this, you know, to the extent liquidity exists or what access you guys have to information, we prefer to actually, uh, in a hawkish scenario, be long the dollar against being short of the Korean won or the Mexico peso um, for today if the FOMC is hawkish. Um, and I just want to be clear, don't, don't get me wrong, the euro will go down, but it's about catching an acceleration point in emerging market currencies when you're given the chance. And the way we're given a chance today is if the Fed actually hikes and we continue to price in a measured pace because that's just the logical outcome when you embark on a new rate hiking cycle. All right, last, last component here, and then we're going to hand this over to uh, John very briefly. Okay, so this conversation uh, wouldn't be the same unless we showed you one more thing where it was quantitative, very similar to our five tools. Um, look at this correlation uh, below of high yield versus all other asset classes. This cor correlation matrix shows how at the moment the market is, quote, unquote, all one beta trade, right? They're all going in the same direction. So for high yield, it's not that we're overly bullish by any measure based on everything that you're reading about in the news, but a substantial amount of future negativity has factually been priced into the high yield bond market. So similar to what we said earlier in this presentation when it comes to looking at the prism through probabilities, right, we don't really care what happens in the future. We only care what people think will happen in the future. And according to our valuation model, Yesterday, we found that high yield is cheap, okay? That being said, if the Fed strikes a hawkish tone today relative to what's actually being priced into the market where we've actually backtracked on some of that hawkish tone, the fact is, is that the yield curve is going to flatten. Small caps and high yield will continue their sell-off. And as you can see per this correlation matrix, it's going to drag crude oil lower and the U.S. dollar higher. It's just that simple. So these are the various regimes we're thinking about. Uh, and probably the ones that we're most excited about is if we actually go on to a measured pace is we want to be long the dollar versus some of these emerging market currencies. I think that's it for me. Thanks very much. Uh, and by the way, these are all the things that uh, we talk about in our Site Beyond Site newsletter every day, uh, which John can talk about a little bit now about how he's going to trade. So I'm going to hand it over to John now. Thank you, Neil. Um, you know, it's it's – for those of you that know me, you know that I am a Sagittarius, and tomorrow is my birthday. And only a guy can, like me can feel so lucky that the day before my birthday, I get a massive FOMC event, and the day after my birthday, Neil will appreciate this, I get the release of Star Wars The Force Awakens. 
Now, seriously, people, how cool is that? <laughs> um, thank you, Neil, for that incredibly robust and thorough presentation. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, the one thing that I love so much about CQG is the ability to come on here and show people how I use CQG to trade the macro narrative. Uh, quickly, about a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a high-velocity cross-asset class trader. I trade a number of asset classes, mostly futures, using the CQG platform. I read uh, Neil's newsletter every day, which helps me set the regime context uh, because I do a tremendous amount of preparation, uh, but only trade in a very short period of time. Understanding the macro narrative is a critical component to how I, how I effectively execute my strategy. And the way that I execute my strategy is, is displayed in my book, The Global Macro Edge, which I have coming out next year. Now, this book, uh, having spent almost nine years in the Marine Corps, it's very important to me that we take care of our veterans out there. All the profits from this book are going to train service dogs that look after military veterans. This is a very worthy cause, and, and, and this is something that, you know, whether you buy the book or not, you know, look to maybe do something to help a veteran out there. And uh, I also love foreign languages. Uh, I speak Japanese and Chinese, having spent four years stationed in the Far East when I was uh, in the Marine Corps and have learned Portuguese and, uh, and Spanish, and my wife is Brazilian, and, uh, and we, we speak Portuguese around the house all the time. So languages, markets, ebb and flow, high velocity, dancing, rhythm, these are all factors that, that, that really I embody and encapsulate in my trading style. Uh, taking the connected dots narrative. Now, a lot of us, and when I began trading, I was, I was a heavy Fibonacci trader, used a lot of technical key inflection points, this is a very sound technical strategy, but what took my trading to the next level was being able to incorporate the macro narrative. And so understanding that a resistance point can incorporate or take, taking Neil's analysis into how I look at the resistance point or look at key technical levels uh, just changes my game rather considerably. And so looking at what Neil just said and then now translating it going forward and ultimately how, how ultimately we execute because I think how I execute and then maybe how you would execute as well is really what this is all about in the next 13 minutes here as we come to the uh, to the top of the hour. The first takeaway: How will the how, how will the, the impact of the dots impact risk-taking sentiment? So I've taken Neil's regime grid, and over the last two weeks we have collaborated, and I've put together um, various scenarios um, using the keyboard trader application, which can be piped into CQG. For those of you who know Adam Sheldon, he's a great guy. He's taking care of me. So what's going to happen here at the top of the hour is Based on that regime grid that Neil went over, and based on these four or five asset classes, I'm going to put in place a strategy that best reflects whichever that regime is out. So Neil's going to actually say, hey, John, hawkish hike, dovish hike, inline hike. And so if we get, you know, a hawkish hike, I'm going to come in and sell the five years. I'm going to sell the euro. I'm going to go after the S&P because equities will be vulnerable and play that. If he says dovish hike, then I may play the five years of the upside. We, you know, again, looking at his regime grid there, uh, that, that, that's a Euro USD play higher. It could be crude oil higher, just given some of the asymmetries in the market right now. Uh, look for high yield, uh, emerging markets and whatnot. So uh, it's going to be very key that because we've done all this preparation, this preparation comes down to just a few simple moments out there. Um, and just here's a little bit of a backdrop in terms of what incorporating the macro narrative means. For those of you who are familiar with Collective2.com, uh, it is a website that allows you to trade from a live account or input your system and then you can have followers on it. I trade from a, a live account, which is what the, uh, which is what right here, the, the, this means right here. You can see um, the TOS designator. You can see that I started this in February and incorporating Neil's daily macro narrative on top of my technicals, a $250,000 account, which is the hypothetical starting value. Again, please consult all of the risk disclosures. Is up 39.8% this year. If you go to collective2.com, you can get more details and we'll show you the trades I put on. And you'll also notice this is that the equity curve has headed higher, but then the last three months has gone flat. And that is a symbolic of my own account as the last couple of months have been very tough for me, actually. It's, it's, it's been a great year, but trading has been very challenging, and I'm actually in the midst of one of my biggest drawdowns. So for me, I've, done, I've, I've put together a phenomenal P&L profile of my trading in the last six years, so I'm not afraid to say when situations have gotten difficult. In the last three months, as you can see from just the flat line here, has, uh, has been a very challenging time trading for me on what otherwise has been a very good year. But that is the power, at least the power I've gotten from incorporating the macro narrative, incorporating uh, a solid regime analysis to what we do. So we talk about market price action, and, and that's 
is I've coined the term impact or the market price action. That's what the acronym stands for. And so what I do, taking Neil's regime grid and taking my own analysis is, is, is figure out where markets are likely to go. And that market analysis, that regime grid will then help me dictate, dependent today if it's a hawkish hike, dovish hike, inline hike, or just pure arm again if there's no hike whatsoever, uh, what, not only what asset classes to trade, but then how far they will go based on the impact ratio. This is something I talk about in my book um, that's coming out early next year, but that gives you some color there. Um, also, a, a couple of things here as I go to the live screen and then, and then hand the presentation back to Neil, there's, there's five types of Fed trades out there. There's the three hours prior and leading up to the release, which is sort of what we've been involved in now. There's the first five minutes after the release of the statement. Then there's the six, six minutes up until the press conference. Remember, we have Janet Yellen giving a press conference to, to give us some more color upon the dot plot and the statement and potentially any operational aspects that are, that, that, that are there as well. So, so if, you, if you keep all that in mind, though, that's the, the, the metric of how that works. Um, and, then, and then let me just go back here. Now let me go and share my screen, and you'll see what I'm going to show you, because I believe factually that for, okay, boom. As this gets logged in here, as this gets logged in here, I believe in total transparency. And, and this is now the fifth webinar that I've done. And what I love about this is that, is that of the three of them that I've come in now, I've actually been down on the day when we started. Now, I'm not, that, I'm not down that much, and for reference point, we're dealing with a 1.5 million nominal trading level. So it's a nominal trading level of 1.5 million. I'm down 1,000 bucks on the day. I think I've come in here. Last year I was down 3,000 when the webinar started. I ended up about 3,000. Uh, today I have a little bit of a different risk profile because of the nature of this event, looking to risk between two and 300 basis points, depending if it's an outlier or not. But if we get an outlier, I'm going to take on a lot more risk. And so I could be down 50, 75, $80,000, depending on what the circumstances are. Or conversely, I hope to be – you know, up that as well. So you're looking between two and four, two to three hundred, two to four hundred basis points. Again, depending what sets up, depending um, if, if it's if it's a major outlier, I'm going to take a lot more risk. If it's not an outlier, I'll, I'll, I'll condense the risk and look to benefit from either providing liquidity or price discovery. So in about two minutes after the release, we have about seven minutes to go right now. Two minutes after the release, uh, I'm going to hop back on because the bandwidth issues. I can't show my screen in real time. For those of you who have watched me before, you know I love showing my trades in real time always, but I will be showing them in real time after the first 60 to 180 seconds, depending when all the flush stops, because broadcasting my P&L as the Fed releases just creates incredible bandwidth constraints. So I'll hop back on very shortly, but I will be calling them out and work with Neil from there. Um, Ami, I want you to go ahead and pass the, the presentation, take control again, so it's off my desktop so I can create my bandwidth. And we'll take some Q&A now from the audience, and then let's freaking trade. Hello? Hi, this is Neil. We've got a uh, set of questions. Can I just jump in on a few questions while we have time to wait here? Fire away, brother. Do it. Let's do it. All right. We've got some basic ones. Um, <laughs> first one was, is, do, you see an, uh, do we use an algo to facilitate our trades? Uh, the answer is very simply no, we don't use an algorithm. Okay. So the second question we naturally got is, is uh, what is the source of all of these probabilities, um, which is effectively somebody asking us to give away our secret sauce or our proprietary model. Uh, but the reality is, is that we use a variety of tools from the interest rate market. So we mostly use euro dollar futures. Uh, we look at OIS, which is the overnight index rate market or uh, overnight index swap market. And then last, we, lo we look at uh, Fed funds futures. And as we said earlier, you know, the collection of these uh, fixed income instruments are the deepest and most liquid in the mark in the world. And what it does is, is it allows us to extract the prices from the market and then apply them to our probability math. Um, I'm just going to go back real quick to uh, our uh, slide here on a question. Um, let's see. Okay, this is our FOMC model. We received a question, uh, why does the top chart on the FOMC model show 198%? I'm assuming they meant 199%, but either way, the, uh, remember, the top section here is the cumulative probability. So December, which we have here is 93%, which again is, you know, give or take 5 or 10% for a, a standard deviation of error, right? So if December is 100%, 
And if you subtract 100% from 199, you get the probability of that move by June, which is there's almost 100% probability that sometime in the next six months, right, we have four meetings that we will see another rate hike. So Neil's going to call this out and then also going to go through and read the statement as well. And, and then I'm going to be scrolling Twitter looking, you know, to, just for in, in the minutes. And like I said, that first five minutes is really crazy, but Neil's going to help provide me with just a framework of, you know, major hawkish, major not, looking at the adjustment of the interest euro, euro dollar curve, all those things to help me as a trader um, execute um, as best as possible. And so, you know, I think the, the thing we want to emphasize today is just the process and the plan that we have behind this. And we've done an immense amount of preparation, and now it's time for me to really rely on my intuition, which comes when you've done the preparation. You have the confidence, you've looked after yourself, you take care of yourself, you're in a very good mental place, and now we're about to, you know, what I think is very exciting is, is, is illustrate how, how powerful a team can be from a process standpoint. I may lose money today, I may make money today, but I'm going to execute the plan, I'm going to execute the process based on the predefined regime matrix out there and then do my best to execute and, and play it from there. So this is a, a real process exercise and I'm, I'm, I'm just blessed that you're all here today to, uh, to, to watch us and indulge ourselves. Let's just answer uh, one more question here before uh, John jumps off, uh, which is probably our most complicated question. Uh, so we'll do our best here, um, just given the time here. Uh, the question we received was, how do you actually implement all these probabilities while you're trading, okay? Well, the first answer is just intellectually, you get used to it over time just like on anything else. At first it's slow and then you pick it up as you get better, right? But to answer the question specifically, right, we think about probabilities again in terms of odds, okay? So if the probability is 25%, then that means the odds are actually four to one against something actually occurring. So if you actually go to our decision tree here on slide 10, right, uh, where we pointed out the certain prices from the March uh, uh, 16 euro dollar futures, right, right, maybe or maybe not for a hike at a certain meeting, okay? So, or in odds forms, we think there's a three to one against or three to one for it actually happening. So, for example, the euro dollar future right now that I gave you before for March, right, is trading around 99, three, three, 99 spot 335, okay, which is closer to quote unquote maybe happening. So if we think that the Fed is not going to hike in March, then we can execute a bullish trade through a call spread or just buying the outright future. And if we saw the future trading near, quote, unquote, maybe not, right, then we want to have a bearish trade on. Very simple. Two minutes. I'm nervous. This is the time when my heart starts to beat like a racehorse and uh, let you know that you're part of it. Absorb these feelings, absorb these emotions, absorb these, uh, absorb these thoughts, and just embrace the moment. Carpe diem, everyone. Excuse the day. Uh, this is Neil again. We still do have a, a, a number of questions coming in, but let's just save them for afterwards. Thirty seconds.
They did not drop that set there. They did not drop the uh, the 2016 set projection. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. I mean, I need to be able to share the screen. I'm not, I'm not permissioned right now. Okay, so you can see here, um, I'm short 10 euro stock, short 10 S&P, down about 20,000 right now. I got short on the, when I saw the, uh, the, the, the set not come down and, and some other factors, just not, uh, and, and basically got stopped out on the, uh, you can see here the euro is what got me there. I got short, but they came and stopped me out the other way, which kind of been what's happened the last couple of months here in terms of way things are going. So short Aussie dollar, so short S&P. You can see the positions here, short 10, short 10. This is Neil, so the curve is flattening, 530s are up, uh, or sorry, it's moved by about four basis points. Uh, we see in our model very briefly that the uh, hiking regime for next and is somewhere clustered between two and three hikes. So short ten off the here. This is between, Neil, am I right, between a dovish hike and a hawkish hike, somewhere between there? It, 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 it's somewhere exactly in there. Two to three hikes for next year, it's clustered. So uh, the best of both worlds is one way to describe that right now. The vote was unanimous, 10 to 0. That's moderately hawkish on, a, on the margin. I'm flat. I just flattened out. That's a scenario. There's no edge necessarily to being to holding those short positions there, at least for right now. So off about twenty-three thousand on that. Um, a bit unlucky with the stop out on the euro in terms of 
And when I got in, I had to, I was using the CQG OCO orders uh, on the Euro and uh, saw the, uh, saw from the, um, the, the Excel spreadsheet from the, the Bloomberg feed that they dropped the, uh, that they did not drop the dot plot short of the Euro, short of the five years and, uh, and the OCO orders came and stopped me out the highs. You can see from the, uh, the trade there, which is, which is obviously unfortunate, but you got to manage risk on these positions because if I misinterpret something, that, that position can run the other way hard against me. Now you have a real problem. So um, let's go to the fills. Let me just go to Euro. You can see here from the, uh, from the deal, that short 20 um, Euro, it's it, uh, 109.40, 109.38, it got stopped out at, at, at 109.67, 109.54. And we're back at 109.40 right now. So a little bit unlucky there, um, but that is what it is. Just gather yourself and I'll gather myself and look for the next opportunity here while, while the market digests. It's my impression based on what Neil just said in terms of how we're between a dovish hike and a hawkish hike is that we're kind of, there's a little bit of a sense of, 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 of intermittent purgatory. And so if that's the case, the market's kind of trying to feel this and that encompasses a lot more randomness. Whereas if we had an outlier event, i.e. if that, if, uh, if we fall into the downside, I'm sitting up legitimately between 45 to 60,000 right now. So from a risk reward basis and from a process basis, it's frustrating to be down, but I like my shot in terms of, of the way that this thing initially set up, we could, uh, we, we could do that or uh, take on that risk. So one way to think about this real quick, guys, is, is that uh, if we're priced for the best of both worlds all of a sudden, two to three hikes instead of a measured pace of three to four, right? Uh, but we've got 10, uh, a unanimous 10 um, voting on behalf of this, including Evans, who was a dissenter before, right? The actual statement is going to read hawkish. The arbitrator will become uh, the, the uh, press conference here at 2.30 with uh, Chair Yellen to see if that she walks back some of that hawkishness. If not, the likelihood is, is that we'll price higher uh, uh, the view of um, three to four hikes or just move slightly more to the hawkish side if she maintains this. Um, right now, though, we've seen you know, a couple of things where people are starting to start to try to interpret things. Um, we've seen no change in the 2016 dots. Uh, there's been an emphasis on gradual. It was referenced twice in the FOMC statement. Take that for what it is. We'll have to hear more about that at 2.30, but all the doves will hone in on that. The 2017 dots came down some. My impression was in two and three now is now we look to, to, to provide liquidity at, at key technical points, meaning that if the euro wants to sell down on this or wants to maybe take a move lower or the fighters want to make a move lower, can step in and bid into those in terms of provide liquidity at these key inflection points. This was not an outlier event. So as much as I would have liked to see fall through to the downside, now to take a step back and think, okay, I still am only through half my risk budget for the day. Um, this is analysis in real time. I can incorporate the macro narrative and now, looking for possibly, you know, to provide liquidity key spots. So the S&P, you know, um, looks like take, get out here. I can get in, get short, take a quick profit, because this wasn't like a major dovish deal where there's, um, in the case of the S&P, it also wasn't, you know, a, oh, my goodness, let's, let's, uh, let, let, let's sell the farm here. So I think that this is a, it was great if you were short ball into this because you absolutely crushed it. But right now we're going to use some of those um, options, some of those open, open interest points, as key technical levels, if we actually get a move from in one direction, which right now we're not really getting that, uh, there goes off the dollar at new lows. Okay, guys. So just going back to our model, which we're going to try to reference in a bit here, uh, the probability of a move in March for next year has moved up to 63% from 54% before the meeting. Right, so the market's pricing something slightly hawkish, regardless of what the statement is read or how you interpret it. And by the way, that 63% is somewhat where we were mid last week before the risk asset correction and high yields started to change the uh, probability forecast. So just going back to the March euro dollars, if you look at your screen, you see them down at 99.31 half it's starting to price in that exact thing.
Let me go over a couple other fields here while I have you guys to look at the screen. You'll see the, uh, the five-year trades as well. Got um, got short some five years, um, four seconds after this event came out, um, and uh, got stopped out on those as well. Uh, just was what it was in terms of the uh, the entry price and the exit price, um, and before it ultimately reverted back again. So that's you know that just is what it is, and that that's some of the some of the game we play when uh, when, when you trade big macro events. Sometimes uh, the, the the algorithms can come in and, uh, and can bump you off your trade, and that's and that's what just happened there, but. You have to manage risk the whole time and, and follow that process. Uh, let's look at some other other positions here. The S&P got short from S&P. Um, again, this is using the uh, the, the the keyboard trader um, that, that Adam Sheldon set me up with. Uh, got short the S&P at um, at, at 20.41.20 um, and uh, and covered some at 20.33 and got and tried to let ten of those run and, and let and got stopped out the rest at at, uh, at 20.48. So. Um, just a lot of whip following this, this, this action. Uh, it is what it is. Um, and look for this next sort of, it, it appears we're sort of, if you look at the two-year treasury, they're, they're stuck in the middle of their range here. High yield is based, go, no, go ahead, Neil. No, no, go ahead. High yield is, is, is literally right where it was, and uh, this was a total vault crusher um, for, for people that were looking for something so far. We'll see, obviously, when Jenny Yellen comes, you know, given the context and the color of that statement, um, there's also, I noticed on the Fed website, an operational release as well. Have you had a chance to, to gather anything from that in terms of, of what that may lead to the press conference? Yeah, ha hang on one sec. Can, uh, Amy, can you give me uh, a control of the, um, uh, the PowerPoint presentation so I can just upload, show everybody the implied probability update? Perfect. One second. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay, so this is just the before and after snapshot. So remember here, this blue line was 93% coming in. Uh, uh, June was 199%. What we're looking at is March right here for this 179 number versus, I'm sorry, the uh, March on, uh, 156 versus 93. That gets us to our 63% proba probability up from 54 uh, beforehand. So we can see that the expectations for March are starting to percolate up incrementally here. I'm going to hand the screen back over to Neil. Um, you know, this is what it is. Um, down about 23,000 today, or a little, little close to 24,000 after commissions. I uh, didn't get the didn't get the follow through and, and get a look for other opportunities, but you know, going to take back over and walk through the possibilities here. As this was a total muck, total quasi neutral dovish sort of just kind of yeah. Well, the good news is, John, there's eight of these a year and 12 non-farm numbers, and so you'll get a lot of time to play. And now that we're in a rate hiking cycle, potentially, uh, the variables will uh, will increase as a result. So that's good news for you. Absolutely. And in the grand scheme of things, uh, you know, looking for something big, if you only scratched on or lost $23,000, sometimes that's a win as well. Most important thing is here, thanks for being transparent and showing us how you do it. It's very helpful. Absolutely. Thank, thank, thank you as well. I think this is a, a great experience, and we'll see what, what sets up the keys. You manage risk. You don't let 23 become 40, become 50, become 60. Um, follow the plan. The, this is the dynamic. If it uh, could have gone well, could have pressed, could, could have added more to it, and now you're up 100,000, you know, like I was two years ago when I did a live trading webinar with, uh, with Denise Scholler. So um, this is all part of the risk complex, and uh, we'll just wait, wait to see what Yellen says and what opportunities develop in terms of playing that range trade, and, uh, and, and based on your real-time connected dots analysis, it's not surprising to see, you know, the market sort of gyrating. The euro came off of its lows. It was good to see that in real time, Neil just pointed out that we have, in essence, between two and three rate hikes, which is that perfect sort of dovish, not too dovish, but dovish enough sort of dynamic, and, and Yellen executed the, the sort of a neutral rate hike, if you will. And, and that's very valuable because if you don't have that information, you may have tried to short the euro at lows, um, again, you know, after the first 15 seconds, I went basically seeing the step, seeing the step not drop at all. Um, that, that, that gave me a great probability, given how the market was positioned, which is why the market initially jerked down. 
And if that thing flushes and falls through, it's a, it's a monster payday. So um, great real-time analysis, Neil, giving the context to, for me to cover my other short and not get stopped out of the full losses, and I might be down twenty to 30000 which those risk units add up over time, so great stuff. Okay, I'm going to leave you here with one last thought. So we've got 15 minutes to the press conference, John. Uh, the day's not over. Uh, you know, what do I think the biggest risk is in the press conference now? Um, just thinking about this very quickly, I think the risk is that she's actually more hawkish than, quote, data dependent on the March meeting, right? She may not come off you know, beyond that further out, but the idea of sort of crystallizing that March is very much on the table. I think that matters certainly to short-term positioning and these regime maps we laid out. Uh, and based on that, if, if she ends up becoming more hawkish, just going back to it, the S&P up 10 or 15 points is a fade if she ends up becoming that way. I'm also going to do a real-time look at Gamma Hill. Let's see how much ball crush happened. I assume it's rather significant. But this is a chance where, you know, maybe coming in, Taking a shot with some with, with some ball crush, you know, S and P options um, can can be very lucrative. I'm, I'm doing that right now. Why don't you answer? Are there some questions? I know there's a queue of questions there, Neil. I'm not going to get anything in the next two or, two or three minutes here to call out. I'm going to look look at some other some other trades. So why don't you answer some of those questions and, and, and get some more context? Okay, let me just look through them. There's. Plus, we lost about 25% to 30% of the option value there. Um, at the money straddle on the S&P expiring Friday was sitting at about 40, 41, or now at about 31. So 26, 27%, depending on slippage on, on working that position. Okay, these questions are a bit uh, a bit uh, granular, um, but uh, let's just recap here because we're going to have the uh, the press conference here shortly. Um, just looking at different assets asset classes, um, the five year and the two year are not selling off. There's an emphasis on gradual. Uh, we're carefully monitoring the inflation goal. Um, there seems to be more consensus about not hiking more than twice, uh, which is where the risk comes in. Is that March is certainly on the table, but after that, it's a very big wild card. Right. I think that's it from our end. Yeah, let's take some. Are there any questions for me specifically in there, guys? Um, I'm I'm thinking I'm gonna just I'm in cruise control now until the press conference. Um, this is about as in line for me as uh, just giving Neil's synopsis there. Uh, Ami, I did some, or Tom, Tom, Tom Harlow, there's some questions for me that I can answer. I have a few minutes here and I'm not going to put on any positions. No, I, uh, this is Tom Harlow. I don't have any questions, John. Um, do want to wish you a happy birthday tomorrow, though. So. <laughs> thank you. So it's a, uh, it is, it's a, uh, Thank you, um, and it's great to be here with CQG to uh, to do this one-of-a-kind event um, and, uh, and play that accordingly. All right. Thanks, guys. Good luck, everybody. Appreciate okay, well, thank you, everyone. everyone. Um, any um, – this webinar, as I said at the start, will be recorded, and everyone who's registered will receive an email to the link. And um, we'll send Thanks out – Thank you very much, guys. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, John, excuse me, can you give the sure. address to that website you mentioned? Uh, Collective2.com. Collective, collective the number 2.com. Uh, and then type in protean, P R O T E A N, but, but collective the number 2.com. And uh, you can see, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's one, one strategy I run next to, my, next to this account right here. I had nothing in there today because obviously I'm busy trading the Fed in this regard, but, but that was all my trades for the last 10 months. Um, and, and there you go. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. And Neil and John, I really want to say thank you for this webinar. Uh, it was a, an excellent presentation. Thank you, everyone.
Thank thanks, you. Thanks a lot, guys. Great stuff. Yep. Bye. Peace.